What I'd like to discuss uh, is uh, the birth of gene targeting, and particularly our contribution to this field. First of all, what is gene targeting? Uh, it's a method, essentially, of being able to change any gene in any conceivable manner in an organism, and our particular organism is the mouse. And so what we want to do, the mouse has many genes, 30,000 genes, and this allows one to selectively inactivate a particular gene. And for example, if little finger disappears, then we know we're in the program for making little finger. And, uh, <clears throat> and then that way, be able to deduce essentially what each gene is doing by what outcome to the mouse is when we uh, uh, modify a particular gene. So how is this done? The experiments actually started uh, back in the 1970s. Uh, Richard Axel and Wiggler had, uh, I had shown essentially if you make a precipitate of DNA and put them on top of cells, the cells eat the DNA, and then a cer certain amount of it would then go into the genome and be functional. For example, if a cell is thymidine kinase minus, this is an enzyme that's required to, for thymidase uh, uptake. So uh, if that uh, gene isn't there, they can supply it exogenously, and they add, make it precipitate, give it to the cells, and about one in a million cells actually then acquires this gene in functional forms and becomes thymidine kin kinase positive. So first of all, we thought, well, perhaps if we actually made needles, and very small needles, and they were like microinjection needles, uh, like a hypodermic, we could actually direct the hypodermic right into the nucleus of the cell, and thereby uh, plant the DNA into the nucleus, and maybe that would work much more efficiently. And that turned out to work. It worked. Now, instead of the efficiency being one in a million, it's now one in three. So one in three cells acquired the cell uh, in functional form. But the DNA went randomly into the genome. It didn't go into a very specific place. So uh, we repeated those experiments. And what we noted is if we put in multiple copies of the same DNA, what we found is that, again, that all of that DNA went randomly into the genome, but something very unexpected was seen. DNA has a direction. You read it from, say, left to right. Uh, and so. What we found is that all the DNA molecules were lined up next to each other in what we call a concatamer, a head-to-tail concatamer. They're all in the same direction. Now, randomly, that's impossible, because we would put in a 1,000 copies, and a 1,000 copies would all be head-to-tail, head-to-tail, head-to-tail. So there were only two possibilities for how uh, this could happen. One is that if one would act like a, a template, and then like a sausage machine, and then turn out more and more copies, and they would all come out as one uh, large concatamer, again, head to tail. The other is by a process called homologous recombination, where in essence, two molecules which have the same sequence can uh, uh, <coughs> be split and be put together again, and then again, we would have a head to tail concatamer by homologous recombination. And we're able to prove that indeed it was homologous recombination. Now, first of all, that told us that the cells had homologous recombination. Second, it told us that it was actually fairly efficient. You had a thousand molecules that are all stitched together by homologous recombination. So that was quite remarkable. The other thing that was remarkable is that we were using fibroblasts. These are cells, for example, that are present in our skin. And that was unusual because people previously knew about homologous recombination, but they thought it had to do with sex. It had to do with parents. You know, you always get a chromosome uh, from your mother and a chromosomes from your father. And then instead of getting a whole chromosome yourself from one, your father or mother, then they're split apart, uh, into many, many pieces and, uh, uh, and stitched together again by homologous recombination so that you get a much more variation, essentially. Instead of getting a whole chromosome, you get a chromosome that's made up of parts from both your father and your mother. And in that way, the variation of gene copies, of gene variation that you get from your two parents is much greater than if you got a whole block of chromosome, one chromosome from your father and so on. So it mixes it up, and so that makes every sibling 
are different from another and simply the combination of genes that you're acquiring from your father and your mother. Uh, and, but we were seeing it in skin cells, okay? in fibroblasts, which were derived from, for example, skin. Uh, and so that wasn't expected. And so, uh, so what that told us is that the machinery is there to do homologous recombination in any cell of the body. So that was the beginning of gene targeting. Now, <clears throat> we wanted to go to the next step. We not only wanted simply to uh, have homologous recombination between exogenous DNA molecules, but we wanted to be able to have homologous recombination. We had extreme, a chosen gene uh, that we're introducing from the outside that we've modified some way, and then put it into cell. It would find essentially its cognates of the same sequence in the genome, exchange information with it, and then any modification that you create in the test tube would now be present in the um, chromosomes of the living cell. So that was the intent, and we, that was what we wanted to do right away, and also we actually even wanted to do it in mice. Uh, unfortunately, it took about 10 years to develop it, so we knew what we wanted to do. We simply didn't know how to get there. And <clears throat> in retrospect, what we're taking advantage of is a machine that normally uh, repairs DNA. For example, sunlight or uh, oxygen radicals that are produced by mitochondria or whatever are destroying the DNA, and they make, for example, a double-strand break. So what the cell first does is just jam the DNA together again so that we're not losing thousands of genes that are distal, for example, to the centromere, which is required to segregate those genes. Okay. However, at the junction where those two uh, pieces of DNA were stuck back together again, a gene is destroyed. However, fortunately, you have two copies of this gene, one from your mother and one from your father. If, say, your mother's copy was uh, destroyed, then you can use the information from your uh, father's copy to correct that, and that's by homologous recombination. So that's our, the ma machinery we're taking advantage of, and it's present in every cell of the body. So <clears throat> what we had to do is figure out how this machinery worked and then present our DNA to the cell in such a way that it would think it's the right copy and thereby convert essentially the copy that's in the genome with the exogenous copy that we're adding from the outside that we've modified. And that took about 10 years to figure out how to do it. Now the other thing that was uh, not apparent, uh, apparent right away was how to then go from cells to mice. And we knew roughly how, to, how we wanted to do it. Unfortunately, the cells that we required were embryonic stem cells from the mouse, and they didn't exist at that time. And then this is so now it, it we're roughly in, 19, uh, in 1980s. In 1984, we already presented uh, data to say, well, now we, uh, we want to do gene target, what we do gene targeting cells. We submitted a grant to the NIH. The NIH uh, found that uh, project not possible. They said, you know, the probability essentially of your piece of DNA ever being able to find uh, that same sequence in three billion base pairs is impossible. I mean, the frequency would be much too low and therefore would never function. And we realized that the uh, <coughs> frequency was going to be low, and so what we were, were thinking about is simply developing a, as a part of a selection. An example would be we have a defective uh, gene copy already in the genome, and we'll add a, uh, a copy of that same gene with a different defect. Either one by itself would not be functional, but together by homologous recombination, they could rebind in such a way that now they would give you a functional copy because uh, there are different mutations on those separate genes. And so that allow, and if that gene is required to, for the cell to survive, then you have a very strong selection that may work, uh, be able to pick up events one in a million or so. And so that's the way we were uh, approaching it. Uh, but uh, still, they were skeptical. They gave us money actually for other projects, and what we did was to utilize that money to continue our uh, effort in gene targeting. And fortunately, four years later, we had information that uh, it actually was working. We sent the grant back to the same granting agency, 
and they sent back a pink slip said, we're glad you didn't follow our advice. So that gives you an idea that, you know, if you have confidence in a particular uh, idea, go for it and, uh, and see whether you can come through. It's also risky in the sense that if four years later we hadn't had the, any results, we would have been uh, in uh, deep trouble uh, in, in, in being able to obtain other grants simply because we would have utilized those funds for something that didn't work. <coughs> Fortunately, four years later, we were successful and uh, the project continued. The other aspect is, you know, how do you go from cell culture to making mice. And for this, uh, at the time, uh, the most uh, attractive uh, cells were called EC cells, embryonal carcinoma cells. And those are, it's a tumor essentially that's made up of many multiple cell types, and, but within them are stem cell, stem-like cells in the sense that they could contribute to the formation of multiple different tissues. Uh, and so I was going from meeting to meeting, uh, looking at how the progress was being made with EC cells. And it was sort of disappointing in a sense that it was working to contribute to tissues of the body, what we call somatic cells. But it wasn't contributing to the germline. And, there, and for us, we wanted to go into the germline because then if we ever made a modification, then uh, we could then generate as many mice as we want with that modification simply by breeding. But those cells didn't exist. And then fortunately, in around 1980, uh, late 1984, I heard rumors that Martin Evans in Cambridge, England, had actually started developing cells that may work. And he, at that time, he called them EK cells. Uh, and those cells, what he did was to, to isolate, rather than isolating these cells from a tumor, he isolated very similar cells from an embryo and simply used EC cells as uh, the driving force to say what kind of cells I want, but now instead of deriving it from the tumor, he was isolating them from the uh, embryo themselves, and those cells looked like they may be capable of uh, contributing to the germline, and therefore would be a suitable substrate for us to do gene targeting with. Uh, so I called up Martin Evans, and uh, this was Christmas now, 1985, and uh, asked him if I could go to his lab to learn how to work with his cells, and he was very uh, generous and allowed us to uh, go. My wife and I went there, spent several weeks uh, learning how to work with these cells, how to use those cells then actually to make uh, embryos uh, in a sense of introducing them to a, what we call a blastocyst, a preimplantation embryo, and then these uh, EK cells are now called ES cells, would then uh, contribute to the formation of the, of the embryo proper once we implanted uh, into the mouse. But fortunately, now these cells were contributing to the germline, so they were perfect for what we wanted to do uh, in, in terms of modifying mice. So that essentially gave you the background uh, for us to be able to then not only go from uh, directing DNA at a particular target in cell culture, but now extending it to uh, formation of uh, mice with uh, specific mutations.